We're going to be calmed and soothed. I'm so happy everybody's chatting with each other. A lot of good ideas are being exchanged. Um, we're going to be soothed by Michael Riversong's music as we started the day today. If you were here, you heard that gorgeous harp music to set the tone this morning. He's recorded about 30 albums, and some of them are very much aligned and designed for healing the physical body. So you might want to check out Michael's work. But his other great passion in life has been the work of Nikola Tesla. He's been working with Tesla Energy since 1984, and he's given a great deal of thought and consideration to how our shift, our ultimate inevitable shift to clean energy sources will impact the recovery and the thriving of planet Earth. So please welcome Michael Riversong, who will play a little bit for us before he gets going on his talk. Thank you. Thank you. For that piece, I used what's called Dorian. If you're into music, you know what that means. The Dorian is balanced on both sides of the center point, and it's something we're seeking in this movement. It's one of the reasons why I was so happy to take on this task of putting together a particular presentation. One of the things that I know a lot of speakers like to do is tell you a lot about why they're qualified to make this particular presentation. Given that we don't have a whole lot of time, I'm going to skip a lot of that. Just rest assured that there's been a lot of homework that went into this uh, since 1984. And that was the year things started really changing. And that's when I started recording albums and when there were a few miracles that happened that brought me into contact with inventors and researchers uh, in a very uh, big way and I was able to see a lot of the inner workings of how these inventions come together. And then later on, for nine years, I operated an environmental consulting service and surveyed a lot of buildings and found the environmental problems, wrote reports, and from those reports, people were able to make improvements. This is something that's very common in Europe, but in America is almost unheard of, and that's eventually why it was uh, shut down, because <laughs> really there wasn't a market for it in this country, but we still have the knowledge and the ideas. One of the things that really got me going was way back in 1970 when we had the first Earth Day. That was the only day I ever ditched from high school. I was one of those people that was a little bit on the edge, but I certainly wasn't a hoodlum either, so they never knew what to do with me. And that Earth Day, I said, I gotta take part in that. For some reason, there's always been this concern with the environment. Part of it probably has a lot to do with watching too many really beautiful places that I used to play getting paved over and turning into just more junky suburbs. I think a lot of people have had that experience, and that might be why some of the people are in this room right now. We've had a lot of things that drove the environmental movement back in the 1960s and 70s. And these were concerns that came up through various sources, including water pollution, air pollution, habitat destruction, toxicity of all kinds. And sometimes that's even in our own homes. 
species endangerment and extinction started to get more noticed. And of course, you have the aesthetics. It's really no fun to see a house that's already falling apart a year after being built, where there once was a beautiful little grove of cottonwood trees with a few boards up in it that made a treehouse palace for some kids. These concerns spawned a lot of environmental organizations. Most of the organizations that we know and love today, Sierra Club, uh, National Wildlife Federation, Defenders of Wildlife, etc., they had their origins during this period. They were based on the assumption that you had to work with the political system in order to make changes that would result in a better environment. And there's nothing wrong with that. You, you really do have to do that. And from that, we got an EPA, which has been sometimes effective, sometimes not. Sometimes the EPA has engaged in projects that seem designed to fail. Other times, of course, they have standardized their drinking water. People don't realize what a beautiful blessing it is to be able to go anywhere in the United States and drink a glass of pure water that won't make you sick. It's wonderful. And legally, that is what has to happen in this country everywhere. And that's not the case in most countries now. So we have made progress. But of course, we see enough deterioration going on and enough causes for scientific alarm because all the things I listed, we now have to add to that climate change because we're becoming more conscious of that, especially in the past few years. And it's not just global warming either because warming doesn't explain a lot of what's going on. But I used to work some with wastewater plants. That was part of my practice. I was married to a wastewater treatment plant operator for 14 years. Learned a lot just hanging around her. One of the things that happened one day was we were in downtown Thermopolis, Wyoming. She opened up a sewer line and I was looking down into it. And what's flowing down there is normal. 98% of what's in the sewer line is water. 98%. Doesn't take much to mess up water. And all of a sudden, some oil, some gunk from some auto repair place down the street started coming down the line. And the water was all turbulent and icky and crazy. And, and then that passed and the water was smooth again. And I realized an important engineering principle. And most engineers kind of know this, but you don't hear it expressed much. Any fluid that has random hydrocarbon residue in it will become more turbulent. So our problem really is global turbulence. And when you start looking at it from that perspective, all of the bizarre phenomena we're seeing with oil and stuff in the atmosphere is explained. And we see the weather patterns doing what we would expect them to do under those conditions, which has become hotter, colder, more rain, less rain. Tornadoes and hurricanes, we should remember, are nature's way of cleaning up the atmosphere. And even ordinary rainstorms to a degree, there has to be some particulate matter in the air for precipitation to occur at all. And of course, if there's too much particulate matter in relation to the atmosphere as there is in parts of the Sahara Desert, well, then you won't get any precipitation. But if you have the right balance of particles, you'll get sufficient precipitation, and that's how the atmosphere keeps renewing itself. It's a beautiful cycle. And of course, now we've got too much particulate matter everywhere, and nature tries to make adjustments through all these automatic mechanisms that were set up a long time ago, but sometimes it seems futile. It's sad. But this is a reason for us to find new technologies, because you can pretty much find where the pollution's coming from. It's not that hard. There are 8 million chemicals out there, many of which are not registered anywhere. We don't even know what they do. And we have, of course, the burning of 
various types of hydrocarbons, diesel and gasoline especially. Each of those has its own profile and each country puts out its own profile of pollutants. And so it's interesting that pollutants from one country affect the weather in another country and people don't even quite realize that's what's happening. Of course, if people wanted to get into a blame game, it could get pretty ugly pretty fast, but that's not the point. And the point is that we have all these different profiles and we have all this fuel being burned and that is driving a lot of what we're concerned about. So you had developments coming up in the 70s and early 80s solar, wind, geothermal, biofuels. I got involved in the solar business in the early 80s and we had kind of a rough go of it because I was competing against liars. It was odd, they had a tax credit for $10,000 for a solar system. Um, you spent $10,000, you get some off your taxes and it was a pretty neat deal. And there were some companies and no matter what you had going on in your house, the system would cost somewhere around $10,000. Amazing coincidence. I actually, being an environmentalist, I found it was worthwhile to look for the best bang for the buck you could get and discovered through some experimentation and some hard jobs that solar air worked better than anything. You could make it out of practically nothing. You could make some of your solar panels out of construction waste material and you could get a lot of heat for that and um, your payback was negligible because sometimes you could literally use scrap and, and that was wonderful. Uh, that wasn't a popular idea. The $10,000 tax credit was better until of course what the government giveth the government can taketh away. And they took us away back in 1985 and that was that for the solar business. And we lost a lot of ground in the interim because a lot of the technology that had been developed and researched in the early 80s was literally lost. And now we just have a few plans and photographs floating around. I put some of the photographs of some of the installations that were done at that time up on the web so those are archived now. And a few other people have done similar projects, so this will help. You can look for that and you can find it. And that's a resource that we have. Well, a small number of engineers, electrical engineers, concerned scientists, they started looking at more advanced technologies. And that inevitably included the work of Nikola Tesla. Tesla's work was incredible. And there were several research threads left behind that never were fully developed. And the stories about Tesla's work are fairly well known in other sources. We won't really go into that too much here. But he did have some solutions that looked like they would really help in terms of environmental profiles and essentially give us what Tesla said could happen. And he said this in 1905 when he was working on his world wireless transmission system, we will never have to burn another drop of fuel. Now when you think about that, and you think about the huge proportion of environmental degradation that happens simply from burning fuels, and that includes, unfortunately, even natural gas, how do we do that? Well, fortunately in this group and in the groups that are aligned with the breakthrough energy movement, there are plenty of people who are now discovering it every day. We're making little advances. Um, this summer in Philadelphia at the Tesla days, we saw a team of engineers fooling around with a replication of Tesla's wireless system and they had it hooked up to a solar panel. It wasn't quite working all the way, but it, there's a step. And there are a lot of little steps like that going on all the time now. Michael Lee's out in California has done some awesome work putting together a lot of different duplications of the technology and has found that the parameters are pretty loose. A lot of ways to build these things that are going to work. 
And so that's good because, again, you can start recycling waste material, or as Buckminster Fuller likes to say, above the ground mining. And you could get all sorts of materials and cost efficiencies just by doing that. We also have a few other researchers who came to light during this time, especially in the early 80s. T. Henry Moray, E.V. Gray, they've probably been mentioned by other speakers. A lot of informal networks and structured organizations arose out of this research, and the, one of the prominent ones was the International Tesla Society. That's where I came in because I was a volunteer with them. And we had conferences first every two years and then every year. A lot of amazing technology presented each year step by step, and some of the threads have gone away. We don't know even what some of these things were all about. We had a few people who were clearly perpetrating various types of fraud, but we also had inventors who were systematically, gradually coming up with better technologies. I'd like to mention in that context George Weissman, who picked up on the work of Yul Brown, so we have the um, Brown's gas generators that he's put out. Wiseman also was able to find some great carburetor improvements. We had John Bedini, and of course, if you've been over to the New Energy Systems Trust booth here at this event, you've seen uh, a couple guys who are working with that technology hands-on, and that is incredibly promising because there we're using the natural resonance of electrical materials to derive a lot of, you could say, hyper-efficient processes. Now we're at a point where each new t energy technology should be evaluated in relation to the positive environmental effects and develop specific profiles of different technologies so that each project can have a profile developed and I'm not saying we should do this on a governmental or administrative level. This is something we all can do for ourselves. And that's the best way to go, really. If we are self-policing in this, it'll help a lot. And I'm asking a lot, but we need to. One of the sad tragedies in our current environmental situation comes about from organic chemistry. Unfortunately, in organic chemistry, you had an attitude for years and years. Well, if you can do it, let's do it. And this is how we got those 8 million unknown chemicals out there and all the pollution that goes with them. And sometimes these chemicals have been developed under complete secrecy. How, how often have you bought a cleaner and you tried to find the ingredients and they weren't listed. They don't have to. And so some people don't. And that's tragic in itself. When you think about that and multiply that by 8 million, we have a problem. And one of the things I'm saying here is that it's possible for us to create even worse environmental disasters than the things we've seen so far if we're not careful. So, yeah, I'm sitting here advocating some caution, and I'm sitting here advocating caution self-generated. The last thing we want in this movement, of course, is for some government agency to come together and start breathing down our necks and say, well, you can't do it that way. And then it's not going to work. <laughs> and that's going to create yet another layer of obstruction to what needs to be done. It's going to take probably about 500 years to clean up the basic damage to this planet. I'm including in that, by the way, a project to rejuvenate the Sahara, because that's a key area. That's supposed to be a mixture of rainforest and savanna, which is a type of grassland that's kind of like low prairie. Very, very fertile. There are four rivers underneath the Sahara that can be rejuvenated. Once those rivers come back up to the surface, we're going to find that this planet can become 
not only healed, but an absolute paradise. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, and it's going to be kind of fun if we do it right. So we have the possibility to produce power generation systems free of pollution and possibly totally non-toxic, which would be great. And then there are several other research lines that are emerging out of that same context, and we're going to mention some of these more specifically now. What I want to do in the rest of this presentation is go directly into a list of technologies that was developed for this conference. It's a wonderful list because we haven't had such a list really up to now. And by organizing our thoughts around these different technologies, we can start making more rational evaluations. And I think we're going to do a lot better at finding, funding, supporting, and extending the projects that are going to have the most effectiveness. First on the list is Tesla's wireless system. Tesla's system was centered on that beautiful mushroom tape shaped tower that so many of you have seen pictures. How many of people have seen the pictures of Tesla's mushroom state tower? That's what I thought. That's a great grand motif for a whole movement. And that um, tower was designed, so there's actually more underneath the ground than there is on the surface. He had tunnels and structures going 300 feet down into the earth. Huge masses of metal included. He said it's all in the grounding. And the first time there was a replication of his technology, uh, the wireless technology in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2006 on Long Island at a conference, a very small conference, we really got the truth of that. You have all these guys that were crawling on the floor trying to find the right ground. And, it just happened that uh, we were in a hotel that had a poor electrical system, so <laughs> it, it was quite a scene with all those guys scurrying around like uh, little critters, you know, trying to, trying to, well, will this wire work? Maybe that wire will do it. And yet, under those adverse conditions, we got something. We got a little bulb to light in the air, and we knew we had it. So this wireless technology is incredibly efficient. It's less resource intensive because the only place you're using any appreciable amount of metal, copper, is in the transmitting and receiving coils. Interestingly enough, the receiving coil, and Gary Peterson has proven this, you don't even have to use as much material for the receiver as you did for the transmitter because on the receiving end of it, it only has to look like the transmitter as a resonant match from the viewpoint of an electron. That means you have a tremendous amount of latitude and design for a receiver in the wireless system. More latitude there than you do for the transmitter. The transmitter, we know certain things have to happen. And yeah, you're going to use a lot of copper. That's part of the environmental profile. And yeah, we can get some of that from our above ground mining operation. And the amount of copper we use in the initial transmitter coil is significantly less than what we're going to use for a power transmission line. One of the big recommendations, and I really, really hope somebody picks up on this soon, is that we have remote wind power generation facilities set up so that you can have a transmitter there next to the wind generator and transmit the electricity down into a valley nearby where the electricity is desperately needed for irrigation. And this can be done on a third world basis. It's not going to take all that much in terms of expertise, time. It just takes a community. So that's a wonderful, promising technology right there. Gary Peterson's is one working scale model. I mentioned Michael Lee's. Um, should mention Henry Ong over in Philadelphia and some of the people working with him. Quite a, 
and Nelson Lemtois, another one. Qu quite a number of people now, and this is going to help a lot. So the environmental profile of this is very positive, and the wireless transmission that Tesla developed is something that definitely we should be pursuing. We have not found heavy electromagnetic fields coming from these systems. That's another source of environmental pollution. One of the things I used to have to do when I was doing the environmental assessment business was go to homes that were located near power lines and people were getting severe health problems sometimes moving into a place. Gosh, you know, it's terrible to watch a six-year-old kid with cancer and then find that right above the front of the house, two feet away from the house, is a what they call a primary transmission line. It's not even the big power line. It's one that runs from neighborhood to neighborhood. And that was sending a field right into his bedroom in a sort of a tent or cone shape coming out of that wire. So everything right underneath it was clean, but a few feet away, that poor kid. But anyway, we also found a lot of waterbed heaters, by the way, just a little household hint. Those put out fields that really hurt people too. And so naturally, I get out some of the meters and I get out a shortwave radio. You can detect a lot with a cheap shortwave radio. It's amazing. And they have those for sale in Philadelphia for 15 bucks at some of these discount stores. Brought one of those into one of the demos at a conference in 2011. And we could not find a signal. I expected when Nelson flipped the switch, we would get all over the place. Nothing. Something is going on with that type of wireless transmission where the field does not exist. It doesn't seem to have any presence between the receiver and transmitter. Where the receiver is, it picks up the resonant field and translates it back into electricity. In between, we don't know what we have, but we don't seem to have health effects. And this again tracks with what Tesla was saying. And by the way, Tesla really didn't think that shortwave radio was such a bad idea. He didn't think that would hurt people, things in that band. But there are bands that do hurt. I'll get to those in a minute. LENR is another technology we need to look at formerly known as cold fusion, low energy nuclear reactions. The environmental profile of that is fairly straightforward. We do have some possibility of toxic or polluting substances that could be used in these systems. For example, there's a lithium reaction. You can get lithium poisoning if you're not careful. Um, palladium, well, you can have a little bit of it in the human body, but not a lot. It's not good to have around in great quantities inside your body. So you have to make sure that your systems are well contained and that everything is in good shape that way. That said, the amount of materials used in LENR arrays is usually pretty small. And that again adds to a positive environmental profile. So you have a few heavy metals some radioactive isotopes of hydrogen, and of course lithium, those are all things that can be present in these reactions, and you just have to make sure they're well contained. There's a potential for nuclear waste. It's small but present. Everybody who goes into this field should get themselves something called a nuclide carta. These are developed in Germany at several universities, primarily Karlsruhe. And these nuclide carta plot out the decay sequence and characteristics of every isotope there is. Fascinating study. And if you start getting familiar with that, with the types of patterns, there is one type of radioactive decay you have to watch out for, and that's alpha particles. And by the way, an alpha particle is the same as a positive ion. I know that sounds a little hard to believe, but it's true. That's all it is. An alpha particle can do the same things a positive ion can do in the body. 
And we know about those coming ahead of storms. We had some on Thursday ahead of that big wind we had last night. That's always something that you watch for with big winds. And it's one of the reasons why emotions of people in Boulder, by the way, are always going up and down because of those ion fields that roar through town, usually ahead of a windstorm and during the windstorm. Wind always, that type of wind that we had last night, always produces a lot of positive ions. And what's a negative ion, by the way? That's another thing that you find in radioactive decay sequences. Those are simply free electrons. And a negative ion is a good thing to have. And they help your breathing, they help every metabolic process you have. So if you have an LENR that's primarily emitting beta particles, that's free electrons, that's actually a positive environmental profile, unless, of course, you have way too many all at once, which is fairly rare. And when you study the nuclide cartridge, you'll see that. So that's a fun thing to think about. And the third type of decay, by the way, comes from gamma rays. And those are very, very high frequency on the electromagnetic spectrum. Once you get the frequencies very, very high, you have a lot of problems, which we'll see when I get to the directed energy part. Okay, hydroelectricity, generally a good environmental profile, except for damage to landscapes, habitat, and agricultural properties. There's a case right now in Brazil where a key tribe, the Capayo, are being displaced. We need to find every Capayo we can, every living member of that tribe, and hire them. These people are the only people left in this world who actually know how to manage the Amazonian environment. None of the other tribes in the Amazon, because of various historical factors, actually have the knowledge that the Capayo have. And hydroelectricity right now, as we speak, is displacing those people. So we've got to go and search them out and see if we can do something about that. Because um, they can help us. They can help everybody. Now, hydroelectricity, you see, has a lot of problems that weren't apparent at first. And a lot of First Nations people up in Canada, they can give you reams and reams of information about native environmental problems with um, hydroelectricity. So let's look at other possibilities. And Tesla did put up several. Some of them, by the way, have to do with just pulling electricity from cosmic rays that are always hitting the planet and taking those ultra high frequency things, cosmic rays, gamma rays, x-rays, and transforming them down into usable electricity. That's certainly possible, and that is clearly found in some of Tesla's patents. Magnetics, magnetism in some forms and frequencies can definitely have adverse health effects. So far, studies officially done by governments have been contradictory. And that's in the interest of a lot of corporations. I think a lot of people in the electromagnetics business, in the cell phone business, et cetera, would rather not know. I guess I could see that. But we do have to watch our magnetic motor technologies. Just get one of those little magnetometers, a Gauss meter. Some of them are fairly cheap. Of course, you have variations in quality. You get what you pay for in that field. If you can afford a good Gauss meter, get one. If you're really working on a magnetic project, you'll be glad you did. And you can precisely measure the fields coming off of it. You can see their extent, which actually is usually not too big. Most magnetic fields fall off fairly quickly. So really, a lot of magnetic motor projects are going to be best solved in terms of environmental profile just by keeping them a little distance from where people are working. There are also several types of magnetic fields. That information is beginning to come to light. And as that does, we can integrate that into our environmental considerations and actually find some really, really useful fields, too. Plasma gas. There are inherent inefficiencies, or I'm sorry, there are inherent efficiencies that reduce the potential for air and thermal pollution. Now, plasma gas projects include Paul Pantone's GEET, 
And I saw a couple things out there in the exhibit area. I didn't have a chance to look at them as thoroughly as I'd like. But um, we do have what we call low temperature plasma. Now we know the majority of matter in the universe, the material universe, is in the form of plasma. That's an actual fact. We living in these supposedly solid bodies are rare in the universe. This has a lot of implications. And you also have the old consideration that plasma existed at 10 million degrees Fahrenheit and above. Well, now we're finding out that they can exist at much lower temperatures. And Paul Pantone really paved the way for us to realize that. So these low temperature plasma actions generally have a good environmental profile, partly because they're using less materials and partly because the plasma reactions are so isolated from everything else. Uh, there might be some problems with uh, metal alloys used in construction of the equipment. Uh, that's just something that has to be evaluated individually in terms of metal toxicity. Zero point energy. So far the designs in this category have tended to be pretty small and that minimizes in itself the potential for pollution. So uh, I like the zero point energy concept in a lot of ways. As a matter of fact, some of that implies the use of nanomaterials, incredibly small amounts of material. And when you're using that little amount of material, you've got very little potential for pollution. And so that's good. The only problem you have sometimes is leverage. You can actually generate more electricity or energy of some sort than what you need, and that can be a problem if you're not managing it well. Now we come to directed energy technology. This is a can of worms. And this is where the most work needs to be done in terms of environmental evaluation. Much of the listing for directed energy technologies is military. And of course, you look at the work of Tom Bearden in the early 80s, and he was talking incessantly about the use of militarized technologies, some of which were apparently derived from Tesla's notes that the Soviets had captured. Uh, some of it, who knows where it came from. Now, of course, you find a lot of different technologies that fall under this category, many of them top secret. There's a high potential for weaponization. Anytime you have that, of course, that means an environmental problem. It's been said that ultimately an army is there to protect your country's environment. Now, if we really lived with that, that would be kind of cool, actually, if we said that that's their duty. It could get a lot better you know, in terms of the way soldiers have to think. And of course, if you start going into the ancient documents, particularly the Art of War by Sun Tzu, he says flat out, the worst thing you can do is get in a fight with your enemy. Now, if we keep that characteristic in mind, that phrase, that can help too when we're dealing with military stuff. Um, I'd like to get rid of all military hardware. I've never owned a gun. I've been urged to repeatedly throughout life and just never have owned one. And I've been in a lot of strange situations, as you, as you might imagine, never needed one. So we can live like this. It's been proven. And not just by me and my limited experience, a lot of people really do pretty well without any kind of weaponization. So this is something that we can apply on a wider scale. We can apply the teachings of various people like Peace Pilgrim in particular, and that will help our environmental profile right there. We have to look at microwave disturbances and splatter. Tesla specifically said that the frequencies we now associate with microwave, which essentially are above one gigahertz up to what we call infrared, that range of frequencies is dangerous to health, flat out. We shouldn't be using them. And of course, what are all those cell phones in our pockets running on? And all those Wi-Fi systems? It's all microwave. We don't know what the cumulative effects of those things are going to be. And so 
we would do best in developing our new technologies to just kind of stay away from that area for a while until we can piece together what's going on. I suspect a lot of what we're going to find is that we have to operate on resonance. So if you have a resonance that goes like this, that's, can you hear that? I'll just sit down and do it right. Okay. You have a resonance like this, that's an octave. That resonance is good. Now you have a resonance like this, that's not so good. Because of the size of cells, human cells, almost any kind of microwave beam, you might say, or wave pattern or anything like that getting into the cellular level is going to create that kind of dissonance just with the cell structure itself. It's entirely a matter of size. You go up a little bit to a different interval, that's called a third, you're in better shape. You could actually create an entire science of chemistry and also an entire science of directed energy just using musical intervals. Thank you. That short piece was actually part of a very long body of music I've put together that uh, is a set of ideal intervals for chemical equations. Okay, now we come to, on the list, cavitation. <laughs> Again, we relate to acoustics there in a very direct way. Cavitation always makes noise. If you've ever been in a wastewater treatment plant and heard some pipes undergoing a cavitation sequence, which is very undesirable, man, those, those noises are horrendous. Anybody studying cavitation should study acoustic resonance. That'll help. And that'll help clean up that environmental profile. Um, other than that, you have the usual concerns about materials, alloys, metal toxicity, things like that. Cavitation is a legitimate technology to research. Just in addition to your normal research, understand acoustics and you should be okay. Last one on the list, as we have it here, is vortex. Now vortex is a funny word because you hear it used by well, sometimes fraudulent operators because it sounds so cool. Man, if it's a vortex, it's got to be cool. <laughs> well, we don't know that for sure. We do know that every material object in the universe has a neutral center. I am advocating that we stop using the term black hole at the center of every gravity, um, every galaxy, and every gravity structure, like a planet, a planet is not a solid ball of matter. A planet is a latticework, a structure of gravity in infinitely long and infinitely thin lines. When we start realizing that, we're going to get a lot closer to working with gravity control, for example. You notice I partly classify gravity control more with vortexian technology than anything else. And there's a reason for that. And if we start understanding the right kind of mathematics, we'll start seeing that instead of sitting there trying to calculate your limits and your differentials and your sigmas and all that with calculus, it breaks down when you apply it to gravity. And I see a nod in the front row. <laughs> Yeah, there's people who've tried that. If you go along with the type of vortexian mathematics that more and more people in this movement are creating and analyzing and putting out, you're going to find that uh, vortexian processes become easy to understand. You'll find that most movements in the universe are helical. They're in spirals. There are no orbits. 
but there certainly are a lot of spirals. Because remember, if the Earth seems to be going around the Sun, the Sun is going around the galaxy, so the Earth is actually moving in this spiral path following the Sun as it moves in its spiral path around the galaxy. And all of this held together by a neutral center. And there's a quote from the Tao Te Ching, an ancient Chinese manuscript, that says, a wheel is very useful, but it is only useful because of the hub, which does not exist. So there's your principle of the neutral center found in ancient Chinese philosophy. When you get into the vortexian mechanics, you get into a lot of things that are totally harmonious with the way nature actually works. Victor Schauberger saw it. And of course, we know he ran into a, some guy named Schickelgruber who caused him a lot of trouble and set research back tremendously. But we have some of his data to work with. We have data now coming in from Baumgartner, who passed away in the past couple of years. Uh, we have uh, Dale Pond's data that's constantly being built up out in La Junta. And we're finding more and more that vortexian mechanics is a really, really good way to go and possibly is a factor in all the other technologies I've mentioned in making them effective. Now remember, avoid weaponization, avoid um, using toxic alloys and chemicals, but yeah, let's go and build some stuff. And when we build it, let's look at how nature built it. Now the mathematics, I'm gonna mention three sources. One is the man who just spoke here, Randy Powell, who I don't know, but uh, gosh, uh, I'm getting a lot of good reports on his work. Um, Marco Rodin has developed a vortexian mathematical system that's gonna work very well. And of course, there's the master of all of it, and I've recently discovered you can get this in a PDF form for free on the internet. You have to do some digging around the R.W. Gray site, but you will find the entire text of Buckminster Fuller's Synergetics available as a PDF for free, and you can start studying it. And if you do, you're going to find yourself coming more and more into harmony with the way nature does things. And that's, of course, the best thing. I'm also linguistically advocating that we stop using the word sustainable, except where it really applies, which is, well, we're gonna get by as long as we can. Nature does not develop sustainable systems. Nature, if you start looking at it, go out in the fields around here, look at the weeds, that'll teach us. Nature develops huge amounts of abundance. Every weed has tens of thousands of seeds coming out. Every cubic meter of earth has tens of thousands of seeds in it held in reserve. If it gets a little dry, the desert plants start coming up. If it gets a little moist, the montane plants start to come up. And if it gets in between, the prairie plants come up. That's the way it works throughout the Front Range. Nature is always creating huge amounts of material. And it's not sustainable, it's regenerative. That's what we're really looking for. And that's what we start finding as we explore vortexian mathematics, because we start seeing a math that's based entirely on natural processes. And yes, this moves us into a higher consciousness level. And it's just exhilarating to think about it. And we find that this mathematics alone can help clean up our environmental behavior. And it can also start giving us the design parameters that we really need to put together functioning projects. We also find, too, that elemental transmutation, it keeps getting mentioned here somehow. We all grew up in school knowing that that's impossible. One element does not transmute to another except under very 
control conditions of radioactive decay. Well, we're finding out that's not true. Unfortunately, again, we've had to deal with fraud. We've had a few people coming up and they'll do some chemical reaction. There's a little bit of white crud left over on, on a piece of metal and, hey, look, that's gold. No, I'm sorry, that's white crud, okay? <laughs> um, what we really need to do is see what's really going on with the possible mathematics, and a lot of it is resonant. And when we start understanding natural resonance, we're going to discover that uh, the Vortexian mathematics, synergetics, Rodin's work, uh, Mr. Powell's work, all of this is going to give us an entry into a much more enlightened age. And we can use this uh, material for not only developing more environmentally sane technologies, but also, and I think even more important, a higher level of consciousness. So planning to do environmental assessments on these new technologies is a wise move. We're in a position to prevent a lot of problems before they happen. And we should remember something, too. It's kind of a good general rule of thumb. All environmental problems are fundamentally ethics problems. You start looking at it that way, I think we're going to make a lot more progress. I'm going to end off with another piece on the harp, something to hopefully send us out with a good little bit of resonance on our hearts. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for your very pure... It was a very pure and non-judgmental assessment of all the technologies. It was really refreshing. Thank Excellent. You, Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is this, Thank this you. is yours? Yeah.